I've been witnessing throughout this workshop, I'm very happy that people are bringing their completely uh, parallel perspectives to the topic. So far, everything I've seen feels like it could knit together with everyone else's story and also be very uh, supplementary. It's not really overlapping. It's, there are places where there's overlap and places where it spills on the outside. And that's exactly what we were hoping in this workshop, myself and Josh. Pete and uh, Alexander, is that uh, we do not wish to have the one view of tensors ourselves, but to sort of understand how the people who have been using these tools use them. So again, I'm going to give you a filtered perspective through what I've bothered to learn about. It doesn't capture everything, but I would love to know as you investigate, in what ways does this fall short? Because I'd like to make it a little bit more useful. That's the real story of it. Um, if you uh, were at the first talk, you know you can follow the slides and there's pockets of information that I won't go through in the slides and you can scroll around at your own will if you wish to or do that at a later time. And because these are live slides online, I'm able to edit them. So if you send me mistakes and people were helpful to do that the first time around. So if you notice that I don't know how to spell or that I don't know how to do math, both of those are things I'll try to correct. So. Uh, again, credit where it's due. Certainly we are very thankful to the funding agencies that helped us with this conference and then personal grants. Uh, but, but really, the, well, actually all those things are equally important. But these three photographs are the most important to me on a personal level. They've been great uh, research relationships. Um, they've made this possible and I thank them all. Now, I think this is merited at least to the mathematician uh, in the audience because there is uh, there's a bunch of great attitudes towards categories. Either this is the future or this is abstract nonsense and, and you can have, if there really is a war between people, it's more on this level than red hats and green hats. Like this is a place where people might actually have attitudes. And I can understand why. I didn't really have a, a interest in categories originally until I was sort of forced into it. Let me demonstrate why tensors in particular need you to pay at least attention to the word category. You don't have to necessarily do a deep dive, but there's some things going on that I don't know how to address without coming in from the side. Here's an old problem. It was actually studied, I think, as far back as the 60s um, in work of, oh, I, I forget. It wasn't Chevrolet, but um, Weil did some of this work. Uh, then Bayer Flukiger, um, Sayer posed some questions in this category, and then finally, um, Goldstein and Gorelnik wrote a really influential paper about intersecting two classical groups. And then Peter Brooksbank, myself, uh, solved the problem. And, and the way I'm claiming is about looking at this with a category perspective. So here's the question. You're giving a symmetric or alternating or Hermitian form. So this dagger might have an involution in a field, if you like. In fact, this dagger might have an eye on it in the sense that maybe there's a field dependent on which index we're in. And you're looking for the matrices x such that when you multiply on this side and that side by this dagger, the transpose or transpose with a bar, you don't change the form. That's a classical group. Intersect over all of them. Take a whole family of them, I, you know, n of them, an infinite number of them. In fact, you can even do this with different fields. At the same time, as long as they all fit in one big vector space, intersect them and try to tell you something about it. Um, you can make this easier or harder, but the, the whole question is what I've just listed. And naively, if you look at this as what this is, and this is what it was attacked with for years and years, was that this was an algebraic geometer's um, ballpark. This is like, there's clearly equations here, there's d squared variables in the x's, and you write down a bunch of quadratics, and then you go to town. And for very, very small dimensions, you could actually make some progress, but a, a fact that's known is that in general, quadratic equations are enough to express basically every variety. So you won't really study everything. So you will fail if you just take it from the perspective of, oh, I have quadratics. Let me go see what I can do. So it has to be something about either these quadratics are special or maybe this is as hard as general algebraic geometry. And so progress was pretty stunted because of that point of view. So let me try to point out why, if you take a categorical point of view, it doesn't seem so scary. Here is a picture trying to illustrate what it means to be an isometry. But I'm trying to do this as an equivalence rather than an automorphism kind of question. So isometry, the way I wrote it, was a group of maps back to the same space that had to preserve a form. Now I'm going to think of two inner products, an A inner product and a B inner product. I'm going to go ahead and generalize and say these are just vector spaces. There's a missing zero there. Okay. So there's vector spaces and they're not even the same dimension perhaps, but the idea is I take the function on A and I apply it, function on A1 and I apply it, and then I take this product and that should be the same as having done this product. 
So I've taken, if I think of the product as a metric, an inner product, then I'm preserving that inner product. That would be an isometry. Let's compare it to this picture, which if you, depends on your linear algebra background, you may have called that something like an adjoint. And everything's the same except what? That arrow, phi 2, is pointing the opposite direction. Does this make a difference? Well, let's write down what the equation is that corresponds to having put the arrow in the opposite direction. If you try to think about how to write an equation, you realize that if I'm, if I'm starting here, I have an a1, it gets sent over to here, and paired with a b2 comes out over here. So I have a, um, I've lost, that's one of these should be an a1. That should be an a1, that should be an a1. So you, you can permute the, the arrows as necessary. But the point is you'll have one side with a phi and the other side with a phi. And now, if you write that as equations, you no longer have x times x. It's not quadratic, it's linear. Well, linear is great because linear I can solve. So if I check what this means, it means that the endomorphisms, the maps from yourself that have this property, are in fact a ring. Solve a system of linear equations to get the ring. And to be invertible then just means a unit in the ring. And we saw in Peter's talk, there's an efficient algorithm based on the Wedderburn structure theory to write down the units of a ring. Well, that's great, but that's not the category we had. I claim it is. Well, good enough. Because if I'm looking at isomorphism, then every arrow is invertible, and so I can swap it. And you could write these equations down and see that you can interpret every equivalence class here as an equivalence class in this category. Now, they are not the same category. Over here, this is an abelian category. Over here, this category doesn't have co-kernels, very non-abelian. These are different categories, but with the exact same equivalence classes of isomorphism types. So how do you solve an impossible question with some quadratic equations? You don't. But if you're able to translate the question you actually asked to one that's easy, you solve an easy problem, then you tell everybody you solved the hard one, and they feel good. That's, that's the way categories can help you. So something subtle here, and there's lots more that I won't describe, but, but this is the key idea here. The interest to me is whether we've missed a lot of opportunities like this along the way with multilinear systems. This was a pretty simple trick, flip an arrow. I mean, you have to follow the consequences. But the idea is maybe there's actually a lot of relationships between different ways to see the same piece of data, put different morphisms on them, but preserve some of the structure. And if you do that, maybe it'll help with some of the problems that are out there. And the second thing that's actually kind of important is um, Peter and I built software to try to build this. And it worked, and we were surprised, it was, we were happy. Um, but it wasn't as fast as we wanted. And over time, myself and Josh Maglioni and Peter had built quite a bunch of tools for this. And they keep getting faster, in part because we stop to think what's really going on. We realize abstractly there's a better way to program this. You don't have to actually program what's in front of you, what's the obvious question. You see that categorically this is equivalent to something else, and you'll program something smarter. So here's my objectives today. I'm going to try to get through some of them. If I don't get through all of them, I'm happy to discuss any one of these over lunches, emails, whatever's appropriate. So I'm going to try to describe a type, a way to write down good data structures. Um, I'm going to hint at the fact that algebra works here, like no, there's isomorphism theorems. Go back to these functors that I had mentioned in the first talk, the shuffles and so forth. And then just to sort of give a sense that this is a theory that's being built, um, I'm going to describe how you do representation theory of tensors. So notation, that's here if we need to go back to it. But basically, I'm just saying I'm going to use some perhaps obscure notation. And in, in, if you're a mathematician, if you're a computer scientist, then this might at times have some programming metaphors in your mind. Here's my definition. Nobody screamed too loud this week, so I'm going to keep going with it. Um, I'm going to say that a tensor space, a tensor is an element of a tensor space. Yes, Henry. OK, I got the same question. I meant to fix the slide to make that clear, and I forgot this particular slide. I did get this question from um, an email from somebody else as well. Let me clarify my definition here. A tensor space is a vector space T equipped with a linear map, just like a group is a set with a binary operation and a blah, blah, blah. So I, I have a vector space, capital T. So above all, tensors are vectors. I can add them. I can scale them. Once I have such a thing, 
I want that every little t in big T, when I shove it into this bra, becomes a function that eats a VL, a VL minus 1, a VL minus 2, all the way down, and at the end it outputs a V0. You could think of all of these as a bunch of HOMs of, it'd be HOM, uh, sorry, it'd be HOM V1, V1 to V0, then HOM V2, and so forth. So the numbers would go backwards, just like you see here, and you'd have HOMs everywhere. And so, you know, it wouldn't fit on the slide. It'd start to get wider. That's one of the reasons I don't like it. But then it doesn't also give you the metaphors of how you cancel and stuff like that. I, I'm not here to win the, the battle of notation, but this has some advantages. Um, once you have that, um, the, the names of these vector spaces collectively I'll think of as the frame because I'm thinking of sort of a box. A box has a frame, it has rows, widths, and so forth. So each frame is the vector space itself. And the length of that frame is the dimension of the vector space. Okay, and the individual axes is what I'm going to use for the word for like what one side is. Maybe there's better names, valence. Uh, I found these words being used by Malsev in some old work. And the trouble is, did he really use them? No, it's a Russian book translated to English. I don't know what word he actually used. So did Malsev use these words? I don't. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the first thing we did. I think it's probably what most people do when they first say, I want to do some tensor computations. I have an idea. Let me go program this. Nothing wrong with getting started here. You simply write a list of lists. You know, you put this stuff in like that, and what you're thinking of is this matrix. Your brain's ready for it. You can see how to make it a flat line, and just you're thinking of it this way. The downside is if you look a little bit under the hood, almost every programming language that's sort of sensible tries to help you do things that are much more clever than what you're doing right now. They assume that you might want a list of actual arbitrary lists, and so they prepare in space a data structure that could be that. And this is great if you want the flexibility of that kind of programming. But the downside is, is that you know you're going to access this grid as a regular grid, and you're never going to have weird symbols in the middle of it. And so this is not that helpful, because what will happen is while you're running the program, if the program has developed a thought that this could be what's happening, then it will check that everything you're doing isn't going to crash something. Are you multiplying a string with an integer? You know, is this beyond the length of the list? And every one of those checks is happening every single time you ask a question about a tensor, and it happens over and over again. Okay, yes, go ahead. Chris. And it would also be hard to extract the second column. <laughs> it would be horrible to extract the second column. <laughs> so there's, I mean, there's a lot of literature on how to deal with large data structures and stuff. By no means is this comprehensive. Um, but if you want, you can scroll down and read about heaps and red black trees and so forth. You can see that what's going to happen naively if you just do this in Python or you do this in magma gap sage is it's going to take each one of these rows and put them wherever there was free space. And then every time you're accessing them together, it's like looking up, oh, this one was over here. That one was over there. Let me get this one from here. And your whole system slows down. And we have evidence to show this. We have lots of computations where in this model, as soon as you change it to what we do next, it speeds up enormously, orders of magnitude. So I'm mentioning this because I encourage people to take ideas and put them in their own systems. So putting a little bit of forethought to this helps. Forget about the grid. After all, my point of view is that a tensor is an element of a tensor space, meaning that you can interpret the grid by evaluating whatever the tensor actually is. Under that interpretation, it becomes the grid. So you don't have to make the grid until you need to think of it as a grid. You just put all your vectors as a vector, just one long row vector. And then the extra secret sauce is to put the grid on when you need it. You just keep an abacus. You know, you move the beads on the bottom for the rows, the beads in the middle for the columns. If you have more beads, you have more structure. No grids needed at all. And you can think for a minute how you would make an abacus, but I'm going to point one out for you in a minute. So you can make your own abacus if you're clever. I guarantee you won't be as clever as the one I'm going to point you to. Um, there's a theorem that says you won't be as clever. <laughs> so, um, and then how would you access contraction, for example? We're going to just evaluate this on various Vs at uh, this particular tensor that's, you know, I'm thinking of it as a rectangle. I'm just multiplying the rows with columns and two vectors I'm going to contract to a point. And you just write down what you think you do. So my vector being flattened will look like some kind of formula like this. That's if we're counting from zeros. You might have to shift by one if your lists aren't zero-based. But, you know, th these kinds of things are pretty reasonable to do. 
And here's the thing, we, we, the first round, you make lists of lists, you find out that's not so great. The second round, you make one flat data structure and make your own little abacus, and then it works much better, but it's still not so great. And here's something, at least with, say, the, the uh, algebraic uh, computations, which is where I tend to spend my time, the things that are in my T, the vector space, might be over F2 or F3. Very simple linear algebra thing there. But my indices might be in the thousands. And quickly, when you profile what's going on, most of your work is doing that. And it's very irritating that you swap to this better data structure, and instead of doing most of the time on the arithmetic of the field you're interested in, you're doing index lookup. It's just like, what? Oh, I've just made a new problem that didn't exist before, trying to solve an old problem. So this is where I would say be a little cautious, uh, more generally that you do this. But this is the line I will point you to. And this is just the tip of a large body of research on Abacus machines. They are Turing complete models. They are very good at one thing and one thing only, and that is incrementing and decrementing. They will count. And why do they count? Because they are, in some sense, the, uh, the abstraction of an Abacus put to a machine. How close to the machine is it? A, X, B are registers in the chip hardware. You can count the number of transistors. It takes four transistors to add one. Four transit. You cannot do complexity at this level with anything else in the world, OK? Like, this is as close to fine-tuned counting as you will have. All right, so if you make a system like this, you want to really be using these kind of low-level plus-plus operator type things. You really need to be using the system's best counter, and then you, you, then you won't do better. It's a theorem of Minsky that you won't do better So, um, in the annals from the 60s. It's, it's a really wonderful area. I don't have time to really explore it fully, but as I started to learn about it a few months back, I was just astounded how much had been done uh, over the last 40 years. Big names, Hart Manis, other people like that got involved. So, second thing that happens, this is just sort of hints that you're making your own toolbox. You should do this. It's wonderful to explore. Maybe you download someone else's toolbox and you fiddle with it. Um, here's the next thing you do. Um, there are two mistakes you make as a mathematician. You never get the minus sign right. You never get the index right. And if you do think about tensors with the indices, how many indices can go wrong? If you have like a probability of one in, you know, 20 percent of the time you get an index wrong, and then you put six indices on there, it's not, it's never going to be right. So you have to think about this a little bit as a programmer. And when you're doing this, the problem is, you know, how do I check and make sure the machine doesn't check that I have to run out of space, that I've got the right places like that, both for yourself and for the computer to be fast? This is my advice to you: don't give indices. That seems a little bit weird, but let's take a look. I don't know if you can see that from the back. On the screen, it's looking small, too. But um, what I've got here is I've got a tensor that I'm inputting by some file or something. Let's say it's 10 by 20, so some big rectangle. When I look something up, I usually think of giving it some number i and some number k, and then that tells me what I want. But what if instead of giving it i and k, I gave it a proof that i was in the range of the indices? or that K was in the range of the indices. Now, this seems absolutely silly. What do you mean, give it a proof? What do you mean, give it a proof? Well, look, I mean, I wrote a proof. I plus J equals 10. So maybe if I was to be more precise, I could say 2 plus uh, 8 equals 10. And if I write that, then my system, at the time that it reads this, knows that's correct. It's, in, it's definitely never going to run out of the space. So what does the compiler get to do? It says, oh, I will never have a mistake here. So I will just go ahead and put 2 there and never ask about it again. It erases the actual proof and puts down the value 2 that it needs to look up the data, and it will never check. It can just do this safely. And this is not science fiction. It is, however, not so easy to program in some of the syntax of current programming languages. But the key idea here is something called dependent type theory. It's been around since the 70s. It was part of logic. It was part of Martin Loaf's sort of exploration of can we create a intuitionistic logic models where you can do constructive mathematics. But at some point, the people say, maybe from the Haskell community and some of the other kind of programming language communities, they really took after this and said, well, we should think about whether we can make programs that can prove as they're going that they're correct, that they can check that they're doing things correctly. So the theorem proving community really built a giant body of literature and theorems. And uh, with that, they have shown us how to make real proofs into data. 
So the equal sign, something like i plus j equals a, even when they're all variables, even when they're all variables, can be made into a proof. Let me just give you a quick illustration of what I mean. So here's a quick taste of how you could write a proof into a program for some step you need. So we're used to set theory where we think of things like the natural numbers are, you know, some something with a symbol and then some successor symbol and you put some axioms like piano postulates on it and so forth. Let's just do that with symbols and not actually build a set, but just think of the type of things we're building. So I'll start with the symbol zero and then a recursive thing that if I've already built a number, I can add a new number to the symbol table by putting an S in front of it. So zero is zero, S zero is what you think of as one, then two, then so forth. So whenever I write three, what I've really told is I've got a proof that it's the number three because I've got how it got built. It's not just the number three is a real natural number and then I have to go ask why it's a natural number. The number three is actually represented as the data that proves it's the number three. And when you do this, you start to see that things like, well, suppose that n is even. If I add one to it, it becomes odd. That's a little claim I can make, right? It's a pretty boring claim, I know. But the point is to make boring claims that let the computer prove the boring claims, and then you can work on the interesting claims. So in set theory, I'd have to do something like this, and then I'd have to write that these two sets um, follow. Well, if two sets, if one set implies something about another set, then how about just making it a function? A function with the domain even gives you an output that's odd. So then the function of successor is the entire proof. So the point is that when I want to prove that adding one to an even number is odd, it's already done. It's just writing down what you did as a function instead of as an implication. And uh, there's a lot more you could say about that, but I'm just demonstrating that you can do simple proofs. Here's a little statement about equality if you're interest, interested, you can read it. But the point is, uh, when you start to do this, you make your code faster, you make yourself honest about what you're doing. When you read a proof, you can see that's what I meant. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nope. But but you're right. There are plenty of things where so. There's two types of induction that have been studied very thoroughly. So this kind is really basic. It's just linear induction. And here, there's really only one path to 19 by the definition that I gave here. But there's a more exhaustive type called W types. These are things that are well-formed. They're not well-ordered sets. They're just any set has sort of a, so what does well-formed mean? So it means that um, all sets that don't have a minimum are empty, something like that. So. There's, there's ways to make trees, for example, as your induction on a tree instead of in a linear path, so you can branch. And when you branch, you can still prove inductively, am I in a lower stage? So all of these proofs are inductive proofs. It's just whether you're thinking of induction as purely the n plus 1 kind of model or anything smaller than some bound. What, it doesn't affect the computation at all, because all these proofs get moved to the very front and then disappear through the axiom of choice, the axiom of unique choice. But what it means is that you'll sit there watching your program compile for an extra hour. So you trade the time to make a more expressive language, to do more powerful things by letting your compiler check that this proof is correct. The more complicated the proof, the more time it takes to check the proof. But it'll still be the correct result. And once it knows it's correct, it will never check that again. It now knows theoretically it could never have gotten to this part of the code without checking that everything was going to be correct. So you have lots of choices. W types are supported in many languages. They are not that easy to program. You have to have a syntax that lets you write trees easily. So it's kind of a Lisp sort of style. Yeah, that one is not so good, right? There are examples of things that aren't constructive. Um, for example, this one is uh, one that I, I get. This isn't prime, but it's in that same ballpark. If I wanted to do equality inside of quotients of polynomials, I'd have to be able to check that I'm in the right ideal. But that's hard. So if the proof is hard to verify, like if it's something that's NP hard, you don't have the proof for it. If you give me the proof, maybe I can check it quickly. OK, then that's fine. But like you proved it was prime, and you gave me a proof that it was prime that was short, then I'd have to trust you. I, I could read your proof. But it's not going to solve all the mysteries like that. Like it won't, it won't prove primes in a very easy way. So this doesn't, th this has shortcomings still. It doesn't solve great big mysteries in the world. But what it does do is that there's a lot of tactics that have already been done by lots of people. Um, 
things like checking that matrix multiplication is associative, that's, you know, that um, multiplication in a field is commutative, all that's already done. So you just pull up in your package, I have a field, and then it will automatically put in all those extra rules and check them as you go to make sure you never have to code that incorrectly. So if you make a swap anywhere, it looks, am I allowed to swap? If not, it says you have an error here. You can't multiply on that side. And then you don't ever get to send out to the world a, a non-working piece of software. But when you send it out, it doesn't do any checks in real life anymore. It's been proved that it'll never make a mistake if you bother to go through all the work of doing it that way. Most of us get tired and give it sort of a partial implementation. OK, let's not dwell there too long, but um, other primitives. Uh, you have this flat tensor. You can assign a grid to it. But the great thing is, is that without moving any data, I can make it a different grid. I just add a wire and move the right number of beads over. And now it's a cube. And the work was moving one integer. Much faster than actually shuffling your data around. Guarantee this is much better to do. If you want to shuffle, like rotate it, well, then you just swap the order of your bars. I mean, you can't do better than doing nothing. I mean, this is like, this is, this is as simple as you can make the structure. You want to make a tensor product. This is a slightly different one. Don't even build that whole strip. If you have a low rank tensor of any kind, then just keep the sums that you know proved it was a low rank tensor. Just keep them separately, and as a linear combination, you add them up. And this is the key point. The main point is that whenever you have, um, here, main point here that because of this perspective that tensor spaces can be any vector space on which you attribute after the fact an interpretation is multilinear, take advantage of whatever you need your tensors to have to work well for your system. They can be files that are stored in some particularly useful way, but make all your work in the interpretation. And then you have these very tiny little programs that interpret your data as the vector space you want. And then you're free to do all these magical things like shuffling, slicing, gluing together, and it won't touch any of the data. It's just some artificial structure that you're imposing on it, and then you're off and running. But if you're imposing that structure, what are you doing mathematically? And I claim what you're doing is you're imposing a category on your structure. You have one piece of data, your objects. And then you're saying, I'm studying it through this category. And if you have that language, it really helps you program this correctly. So let's do those categories. Um, I'm not going to go through this again, but there's a picture of what multilinear maps mean. Here's the thing I think has helped me in my life, and I think it, it's something to impart to, to anyone, really. If you're studying tensors at some level of abstraction, then almost anything that could have been done with non-associative algebras applies to tensors. And if you think this way, then you're not stuck with a blank sheet of paper anymore. You can go to a library and you can check out a book that has the word non-associative somewhere on the cover. And you start opening it up and you say, what had people who spent a long time thinking about it, clever individuals, how did they do something? And then you start to see what metaphor I have. Let me demonstrate one. Here's the first category of tensors. So A and B right now are just two rings, two associative, two Lie algebras, whatever rings you're happiest with in your life. And phi is a homomorphism between them. OK, what does that really mean? I claim, of course, the definition says, if you put the product inside phi, then it's the same as applying phi to both sides. And that's perfectly reasonable. That's a great homomorphism property. I've bothered to specialize the products with two different symbols. Normally, we just do it by juxtaposition, but I really want to emphasize that we want to think of these things as non-associative. Don't, don't put extra axioms on here. That's a perfectly reasonable version. How do we make this into a tensor metaphor? Number everything. So instead of calling this A, 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 call it A2, A1, A0, B2, B1, B0. Instead of it being all phi's, phi2, phi1, phi0. You've just written an equation that could be written and expressed for any three tensor, any bilinear map. That's all we've done. We took the metaphor of a homomorphism of rings, and we came up with some kind of homomorphism of bilinear maps. And then turn two into n, or v in this case. Just add more spaces. And you know what side to add them on. You just, well, actually, you can add them to both sides if you want. But just put more pieces in, and you'll do the same numbering. 
And then, okay, now you've came up with an equation for a family of homomorphisms between these algebras. Oh, they're no longer algebras. They're now just arbitrary tensors of valence V, V plus one, I guess. And then collapse the columns. Just think of it sort of like in homology notation. You put a little star on your counter, whatever you say. Say, these are one clump. And then you've just created a category. And the category is actually what? It's just the list of these regular good old-fashioned linear maps together with this identity, which is pulled off of just generalizing what you see. This one has a name, actually. It's called homotopism. At least that's what I call it. For non-associative algebras, um, Adrian Albert introduced this in the 30s or 20s, somewhere around there. He was trying to study uh, non-associative algebras. And he realized there are way too many of them to study. So what do you do? You make a bigger, weaker version of equivalence so that I don't have to study as many. There's bigger classes. So instead of just having FFF like you would for normal isomorphism, he said, well, let me just do F, G, and H. So that way I can make even more things come together. And I'll worry about how they split up later. And so these he called homotopisms. Actually, he calls them uh, an isotopy. But isotopes have many uses. And I was told when I first submitted papers with the word isotopy that it should be an isotopism to match with the word like morphism and so forth. I complied, but I was happy to see that not everyone has complied. Thank you for proving that I was not on the wrong track. But um, anyway, now I've used homotopism, having been chastised. So you can ism if, if you want to. Albert did not, and at least two of us in this room did not initially. So <clears throat> here's a more general definition. Oh my goodness, what is he saying? Nothing more than what I did on that slide before. Just put your things along the diagonals. I mean, like, you know, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 7,000. And I claim they capture things you already know. For example, we already saw they captured algebra homomorphisms. That was the first example that motivated us building them. Fine. They also capture linear maps. They capture isometries as well. So if I look at this, here's a picture of a linear map. In this case, it looks like it's linear on the right. So I think of this as a vector and the scalar. They're actually just arbitrary elements in a vector space. I don't care what they are. But if you think of a vector and a scalar acting on this side, so maybe this is a row vector and this is a, a scalar in the real numbers, if it comes out, then you would call this map linear if it was the same space, if there weren't numbers on it. Well, OK, so a special case is when this, this is actually linear maps. But it's a generalization. And what you can see is that that's got an arrow going this way. This is the identity map, so it kind of doesn't need to have an arrow. And then there's an arrow that way. Isometry, similar story, two arrows going over and an identity map. Is that clear? Yes? So in the isometry, A, A1 and A2 are vector spaces? Or yeah, I mean, for, for uh, sufficient purposes, there are vector spaces. Um, all of this can be done without even the word abelian. You can just say, I have an additive category and blah, blah, blah. You can, you can go down the world of abstraction to the degree that you're comfortable. But vector spaces is a great place to park it. Okay. So with that example, then when you multiply them together, you get A0? Yeah. Maybe it's the dot product, right? Maybe this is R2, R2, and R. And it's just the usual good old-fashioned dot product in R2. Well, that's distributive on the left and distributive on the right. So it's bilinear. Anything with a distributive property is allowed here. Yes? Um, this Did I make a typo somewhere? No, no, but I'm just wondering. There, like, there is a zero on all of these. The, the nomenclature, like this is not what I would usually think of as an isometry. Of because phi 1 doesn't equal phi 2, that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do symmetry in this talk, but I've, I'm happy to discuss it with everybody. There should be some version of symmetry. Maybe this should have a different name. But yeah, I mean, you can impose conditions. Like in the case of the algebra, we insist that it be the same map everywhere. In the case of isometries, it's very common to assume the same map in the two spots. And that really affects computation. I, by all means, I'm very aware of that. I use that a lot. But, uh, but for the purposes of this introduction, I wasn't doing it. Yes? Yeah, OK, so it's not just a B0. It's actually a capital A0. You're absolutely right. Oh, right here. This would be capital A0. That would be capital A1. Thank you. I will try to fix that, because that really will be confusing. But yeah, any place, there's, any place there's an equal sign, then they're equal as types, or as sets, if you believe in sets. OK. <clears throat> That's not everything. 
That, that was, a, of course, it was an exploration of one metaphor from non-associative algebra. So why should that be everything? There's bookshelves on non-associative algebra. There's not quite a library on non-associative algebra, but there's definitely bookshelves. Okay. Um, let's just explore the simplest example of you're not done yet. No one should waste their time reading zeros. I know, we echelonize a matrix, we get a bunch of zeros at the bottom, and that's when we stop reading them, right? As soon as we get done with the pivots, that's it, stop. There's no more information to be read from the bottom of your, maybe count the number of rows. But. So when you have a bunch of zeros, information theoretically, you just delete them. Like, you, don't, you don't need anything from that anymore. That's called a degeneracy. It's this different concept than singularity claim Every, singularity, every degeneracy is a singularity, converse, very false. Things can be non-degenerate and still have singularities. Like the identity matrix has zeros all over it, but it's very much full rank. Okay, <clears throat> but all right, so what, what am I saying here? I have some initial product. The product takes vector space A2 times A1 and comes out as A0. Maybe it's the dot product, whatever one you're interested in. And there might be vectors in these vector spaces which do nothing interesting. A2 times everything in A1 is zero. Well, let's factor that out, A2 divided by those numbers. Just take those rows out of the matrix. Take any columns out of the matrix that aren't useful to you. That would be this one. So it's easy to see how to remove it. And there's one other one, though. You know, what if I took a tensor, 3 by 3 grid, and then I chose to, behind it, stack up 4,000 zero matrices? Am I helping you? So if you don't hit that as part of your output, why are you writing it down? It's not useful to you. So there's this version of, well, take the image, and now this is the piece you actually go do computations on. Reduce all the other stuff out of it. But you cannot write this down as a homotopism. You cannot write this down as a generalization of the idea of homomorphism. And this is just one example. You might really torture yourself to make this one work by putting in, you might, for example, think of your space as having a natural sort of inner product, and you can think of a complement to this thing. I claim you're forcing it. It's better, you're going you're gonna to find that problem show up in another area. You might fix it here, and it's just like a carpet that's too small to fit in the room. You got it in one corner, and it popped off the other corner. <laughs> so you got to chase that side down. The better idea is to just relax and make another category. Um, here's another category, also not part of the homotopism crowd. Why? Because I can make this any direction I want, but when I do an adjoint, I can't swap the arrows anymore. They really had to go that way to be linear. And this was a key important one for us. This was what started off our whole story was we had this question of intersecting classical groups. They were in this category that was homotopism based. The arrows all went that way and it gave us quadratic equations and we were stuck. And the trick was to sort of break the quadratic by flipping an arrow. You were wanting to leave the homotopism category. That was the best idea you had. So you want this thing to exist and be allowed somewhere, but it won't be one of the things you had before. So, further categories. So this is my main sort of fear in life, as I'm walking around not seeing the elephant, right? I'm pushing my hands on the legs. Yes? Is reversing one of the errors of It's not functorial is the downside. You can't take a non-abelian category to an abelian category. So I can give you coordinate-wise descriptions, but I, I, at least I would say I predict you won't be satisfied at some point. Because of the failure of this being functorial, whatever I'm telling you somehow hits something. What's happening is that the skeletons of the two, two are the same. They have the same isomorphism types, but with a whole lot of extra different uh, operators. One is much more rich in operators, and therefore it has things like every homomorphism has a kernel and a co-kernel, and the other one just doesn't. So, uh, say say that louder. You, you said that, that this observation itself solves the problem, so it was just enough to understand the skeleton. Of that, of that is it enough? I mean, that was that was I think after you boil down the sauce, that's what's left at the bottom. Is that a good analogy? I have no idea, but now I'm hungry. <laughs> now I'm really hungry for something with sauce. So <laughs> uh, if you check on what I'm doing here, if, if you just go with the metaphor of swapping arrows, you'll come up immediately with how many possible categories. You have n rows, and you're going to swap arrows exponentially, 2 to the n. 
Right? Well, that's a lot of the categories you might not have been exploring if you only studied one out of the two to the n. Even with n equals three, you're missing seven. So, okay, but are they really actually that different? That's a good question. Are they actually maybe equivalent? Does it really matter? They're not all equivalent, I'll tell you that right away. There are in, in n equals three, there are two that you need to worry about, and every other one can be got by something. But there's still more than one. Um, and then you start to ask good questions like, uh, how would I work in this category? And am I missing a category? Is it just these two to the n? If I have exponentially many and I was only studying one, then maybe there's actually even more than that, factorially many or something. You know, what, what limits have you put yourself into by thinking the way you have? And then if I have categories, there are a lot of rules. When you give me categories with enough properties, I can start to prove things like, is this a module category? Is it locally? If it is a small subcategory of it, is that going to be um, a module category? Things that you might want to do. So let's see what we can do with it. How would you get your hands on seeing that you've seen them all? How would you possibly classify all the categories? And here's the idea. I don't claim to solve every way to ask this question, but it's at least an inroad that I can give some context to. Whatever thing is going to be a category, it's going to have a composition. That composition means that the endomorphisms, the things that go back to themselves, if I keep doing this, will make something that's closed under composition. Composition is associative, check. It's going to have the identity, oh, it's going to be a monoid. So let's park it there and say, we had on the first day, we motivated that when you put transverse operators together, you get polynomials. Polynomials in many variables, but as soon as you're studying tensors, you see polynomials. And we had this classification of the polynomials that were linear, and that led to the discovery that maybe the right tensor product is over a Lie algebra, not over an associative algebra. Let's follow the same thread of, of ideas. Let's see if the polynomials can guide us to some useful categories. So I'll remind you briefly what's going on with the polynomials. I have a transverse operator. A transverse operator just means a product of endomorphisms of each of the vector spaces in the frame. Each axis is going to be acted on. That means that I can take, say, the one that's acting on V0, and I send it to the operator 1, tensor, 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 down to V0, I put that operator. The one that's operator 2 goes 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, then in position 2 is operator 2, and then 1, 1, 1. So just putting identity matrices in the X, and that's the representation of where xA goes, xB goes, and so forth. And then if you extend this, you get all polynomials and n variables get mapped to some operator, some linear combination of operators. The kernels of these things are the annihilators, and theorem, these are computable in polynomial time. Okay, that's just saying this again. Here's the example that I left us with at one point. Um, I said, it, you take a tensor, that has this structure, it has zero block, zero block, and then this u might go into the board, right? It's some large vector. And I can act, if I act on, say, the outside, I act on the u by a, so both the u's get translated by some matrix a. But then if I wanted to come down, I'll act on the columns by identity in a. So the identity stripes that with no change, and the a stripes that, well, actually, a, a dagger stripes that. And if I go this way, then it's one and, I, and a, a stripes the rows, and identity stripes those rows. And if you follow this out, you see an interesting relationship. Where at? Well, this thing is the same as having that, right? And that thing is W0, and that one is W1, W2. So I got this polynomial trait, which is a different polynomial trait than just single you know, annihilators would tell you. And that, I claim, will have something to do with the homotopism category we already saw. Okay, remind you of these sets. The sets are T for the, the, T is the analog of eigenspaces, right? If you give me some polynomial with some characteristic, you know, like it's got some factor like X minus two, then two would be an eigenvalue, and delta would be the actual operator that is having that eigenvalue, and then T here would be the eigenvectors for it. So this is the generalization of an eigenspace as a subspace of the whole tensor space. And this I set is akin to, say, the annihilating polynomial, the characteristic polynomial, or factor of that. That's just the analog of that. And if you're from Lie algebra, you'll recognize the Z set is a generalization of the concept of weight spaces. I mean, of weights. If you don't know that word, then I don't have an analog for you. It's just a thing. And there's this correspondence. You give me any two, I get the third. And it's in a Galois ternary correspondence. I won't repeat much, I'm just giving these details. Okay? The derivation was to look at this idea 
And then we saw the consequences were things like, when we look at this, this particular one was a generic, homogeneous, um, degree one polynomial. So that's generically what a linear thing should look like. And that turns out to be the derivation condition. Oh, great, it's a Lie algebra that's behind the covers. And you go off and do your things. Um, let me quickly mention this. If you wanted to see the action um, to compare, if you were trying to study isomorphism of some particular tensor, you can study it by saying, well, let me make the tensor product of the, of the space in blue and the space in yellow. That'll be this big green space. And then isomorphism is to say, which thing in the reds makes me get that one? And if you don't like that shape, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go down. I meant to go down. You can try it on the other side and say, well, what if I take the verser? And so forth. And you do this, and people do this, but uh, here's the thing I want to end with on that part. When you do the denser, it says, why don't we tack all sides at once and just do this? That's what it says. That don't make... Don't attack it from the left and from the right and from the bottom. Just attack from all sides and shrink it to a denser space. And no, the spelling here is not a mistake. Densor is for derivation tensor. Okay. All right, so now it's the same thing with groups. Why groups? Because I want to make categories. That means the composition has to be back in the set. So when am I going to guarantee the composition is back in the set? Well, if I have functions that are invertible and I take their product and either they're in the same order back in the set or their inverse is back in the set. If I can make polynomials that satisfy closure under composition, either directly or in op, then I have created a group. And if I have a group, then there might be a category that made it be a group. It might be the automorphisms in that category. And here's the theorem. This one continues to surprise me because I, there's so many pieces of this I understand now, and so many pieces I still have no idea about. And I think Josh is in the same boat with me. Um, this is just one that we're we're still learning what this is saying, but this is what it says at the highest level. Give me any set of operators controlled by polynomials, one of these Z sets, with these generalized weight spaces, and tell me that it is actually a group, that it's closed under composition and inverses, and I guarantee that the ideal is generated by these binomials. In fact, the bounds on the exponents is zero and one, and therefore also disjoint. That's a weird thing, but what we've just said is out of all the possibilities, there's a finite set of options. So classification is now a real thing. We can go through a finite list. It's still an exponential list, but it's a finite list. And remember, we had an exponential somewhere else, right? What was it? Two to the n, flipping the arrows? It's the same list. So we didn't miss anything. If all we looked at was flipping arrows, that's actually the right set of categories. Nothing's missing. Here's an example of it. <laughs> Let's take that one that we saw in that slide earlier, where we traced around the, the, the hypercube and moved things around. This is claiming that the, the operators phi, which are numbered phi 2, phi 1, phi 0, satisfy what? x2, x1, x0. So there's two on one side and one on the other side. That's just the homotopism rule. And it's illustrated right here. You can see the composition. If I take one of them that satisfies this rule and another one that satisfies this rule, then composition says just go right through, and the arrows all line up, nobody's hurt. And now let's flip an arrow. Well, the flip an arrow is going to correspond to some polynomial, and you can see what I did is I swapped the rules of 1 and 0. And it certainly makes for a goofy-looking morphism now, right? I have phi 0 and phi 2 on the same side. That's nothing like a homomorphism rule, but it still applies, and it still makes a group. How does it make a group? How does it make a category? Well, you notice that the composition is this direction on these two and the opposite direction on that one. That's not wrong. It's weird, but not wrong. And in particular, this one contains our adjoints, doesn't it? Right, if I put the equal sign at the bottom, I make all the bottom ones the equals, then I have my arrows going in the opposite direction, just like I needed. So by just taking the unbiased path of saying, well, what can happen? What's an unforced choice? You end up discovering that the things you need are actually all going to work out and fit together. <clears throat> Until you do this. Everything's working wonderfully. And no one's getting harmed. And then two arrows crash into each other. And that's because there's so many morphisms now. And this one I'm still frustrated about. I have a solution that I'm going to list here. But it's a solution with a lowercase s. You can just compose the relations, right? 
You can say, forget about phi being a function that has a domain and a codomain. Just think of it as a relation of things on the left and things on the right, like a bipartite graph. I could take a bipartite graph, another bipartite graph, and then kind of take the trace between all of them and call that some new thing. And that's all that I'm doing here is just glue together these as graphs. But that has no directionality. So the great thing is, is it doesn't actually see the arrows. So what I'm saying is, oh, you can compose them by just erasing the arrows. Problem solved. <laughs> Uh, but this is very unhelpful because now you don't know what the arrows actually are. They're not functions anymore. What does linear mean? And so you've created a much bigger space where you've invited way too many guests into the party. So this is the question I was asking some of you earlier is, this should be done better. Yes, Ian. Yes. And what does that mean uh, to, be, to be determined to some degree? Yes, Henry. I do, I do actually have some, some, there's a reason I'm bothering to compose them this way. It's not just because, well, I had two arrows. Let's see what happens when I crash them together. Um, it, you can make a mapping from this larger thing onto any symmetric monodal category. So this is kind of like the universal completion of symmetric monodal categories. That's my prediction, if I can get the details of what this actually is. So that's on camera now. So there, please don't solve it without involving me. <laughs> um, this is called an allegory, if you do what I did, where you just sort of throw in all the relations. I don't want to belabor that. But the point is, once you have an allegory, then, um, wasn't Freud, I forget, I forget who, who really started allegories off and there's a whole book on it, but, but anyway, you get a lot of algebra back. You get Noether's isomorphism theorems, products, co-products, a bunch of things. This is a growth in D2 category, something like that. But this is my warning, this is not right. We've just put way too many morphisms in here. Whatever we're doing is probably more than we wanted to talk about. All right, let me kind of close it off here with some, some applications. Shuffling frames, I promised this was a functor, so now I can tell you what it actually is. So shuffling is just put a box in front of a child and see what happens. It will be moved. So <laughs> I've seen that in experience, as have many of you. Oh, sorry, my slide kind of mushed together there. So this is a floating object that floats away for a second. Um, shuffling, I claim, is taking one axis that was previously pointing up and making it point down, but then you'd have to move the axis it moved into out of the way. So well, let's just say that we swapped these two and kept the other ones where they were. So just a transposition. If you can do all transpositions, you can do all shuffles. And I claim that really what you have is you have this one primitive operation that swaps without actually thinking of it being a morphism. And when you have something that swaps without being morphisms, that's a functor, right? And I'm being vague, but that's good enough for what I'm trying to say here. So there's a, the dotted lines are saying how to transport from here to there. And if you think about it, there's a formula for that, and that's the functor that I'm hiding. And what it does then is the previously pointing this direction black arrows have to not only reverse positions, they have to reverse directions in order to keep the arrows all composed together. Uh, and as I'm looking at it, I realize my arrows aren't composed in the right order, and that's my fault. One of these should have flipped. Like, this one should have gone that direction, and so forth. But anyway, I will fix the picture. As you can tell, lots of things happened on this diagram that shouldn't have happened. Um, but I was very glad to have drawn that. That was a nice little Tixie experiment, which somebody else knew how to do, and I learned how to cut and paste it. Um, this is just saying that. But let's end with representation theory. So now you have these categories, you'd like to do something with them that maybe you could learn something new from, something powerful, if you can come up with something powerful. I said everything with non-associated algebras can be done with tensors. It will surprise you what it is, but then afterwards you'll go say, of course it was already known. Let's do representation theory. What's representation theory? Lots of decisions. You can make it module theoretic, or you could just say, I'm going to take representations into endomorphisms. That's a classic way of talking about representation theory. So A is an algebra, and M is square matrices of some vector space. And this is just an algebra homomorphism. What is that really saying? Expand it. Expand it as a product. To be a homomorphism says you preserve the product, so write the actual product. 
Then what do we do? Number everything. And then it breaks. What on earth are you doing? Let's put numbers on this. Let's say this is R3, R2, R1, just for numbers. So this is R3. So this might be something like 3 by 3 matrices. That might be 2 by 2 matrices. Good luck. Good luck multiplying those matrices together. It's not going to work in any meaningful way. So you do have room to be creative here. Oh. Who said that the right thing to generalize was square matrices? Why don't you generalize to rectangular matrices? See, why don't I have endomorphisms, after all, are just this, right? They're just a type of rectangular matrix. So when generalizing, you have to sometimes look for those opportunities to see what really should have been there. And you look back and say, of course, all representations were into rectangular matrices. They were the domains and then the output. It was always what we were doing. We just never thought of it that way because we thought of them as all being the same set. And so we made a lot of effort to sort of see the same settedness. But the result is that the homotopism into matrix multiplication is exactly the concept of representation theory. If you take a bilinear map and you represent it homotopically into matrix multiplication, that's representation theory of bilinear maps. And you can generalize. Um, so there's a slide in some previous talk where I say, is this a quiver? X and Y and Z and so forth all commute. So it's not technically a quiver. And in particular, the thing to keep track of is that these here are really one object. They're, not, they're a bilinear thing. They're not actually a bunch of linear things disconnected from each other. I'm drawing it as a bunch of arrows, but they're really about one object. There is an open question, does this still hide a quiver somewhere? And I don't know that. It would not necessarily surprise me to find that there's a quiver, but it's not the obvious quiver. At least it hasn't been shown. I've not seen how to show that there is a quiver immediately just because you drew enough arrows. It's, it's not quite. This here is one object with one morphism between them. But if you see more than I'm seeing here, I'm happy to, to talk about it, because I, I don't know yet. I would love to see a quiver show up, so that way I'd know it's challenging and I'd feel proud of being there. But it's probably not as challenging, and therefore it's just that's why you can make progress. Just this, it's just matrix multiplication. It's just matrix multiplication. So what I was going to do is expand that to more generality. So now that this was a generalization of matrix multiplication, was the represent representing into matrix into rectangular matrices is the representation theory of, te of bilinear maps, then there should be trilinear and quadrilinear and nlinear. So again, I'm going to use my circle notation to not have it all go everywhere. So if I do this, I thought I had a slide that, OK. Ah, I know. Oh, sorry, I lost track of what I was doing. If you, I'll stop with this. If you have a representation into matrices, then you also have a module. Let's see that that happens. Maybe it was a fluke. Maybe there really isn't module theory here. But let's make a module out of it. So you have these spaces M1, M2, M0, so forth. That has to be a 2 for sure, because when you compose a function from M2 to M1 with M1 to M0, it goes from M2 to M0. So that's a 2. I'll fix the slide later. So now I'm going to make a module out of this. And I'm going to say, oh, let's just uncurry this product, right? I have a function which maps into a set of functions. Another way to think about that is a function on pairs. So now what I have is an action of A2, an action of A1, and an action by A0 satisfying the laws of an associative module. M times A times A prime is M times A times A prime. But when you write it with bilinear maps, you realize you need to give each one of them a separate name because they're all coming from different places. So there's a product through here, which is the star, and there's a product horizontally, which is the module. And that I call a triptych. And that's the module theory of bilinear maps. I'm just demonstrating every idea that's been done for non-associative non algebras has a metaphor here Shores lemmas, simples, all of that works. Here's a classification of the simples. They are products without zero divisors. What's more fun than that? It's just like vector spaces, like fields, are the sort of the ending point of all of algebra. Well, products without zero divisors are the ending point of bilinear maps. 
I just think that's a nice way to go with the theory. It's, it's guided by experience. It's not guided by, I want this to happen. Anyway, I don't know where this really ends, but these are some guiding principles that I've seen useful in research over the years. I've stolen a lot of this from looking at other people's ideas and then giving my names to it. Um, so I encourage you to do the same. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so the question was relating to a slide composing multiple morphisms. And um, what's happening here is that I'm forgetting about them being arrows. I'm thinking of them as being, instead of input to output, I'm thinking of A comma B. And there's no directionality to an ordered pair. It's just a point in space. So if you're thinking of the function, then what I'm thinking of is the graph of the function, the parabola itself, or something like this. And what I'm saying is if you give me a function that on one side has A's and the other side has B's and I choose to think of it just as a graph, then I can compose that with any other graph by doing this. I simply say, does there exist a point in the middle to transition through? You know, is there an A that meets a B that then on the other side has a B that meets a C? Now this might have been the output of a function pointing this way and this might have been the output of a function pointing that way. Two of them happen to meet at the same value B. I still throw that in my list. It has no meaning as a function anymore because it could be many to one, right? There could be lots of points going to be, lots of points going to be from that side. So what you now have is a relation that's going through all of those fibers. So that's nothing function-like at all, but it's still composition. So like, if you're doing that in this case, starting with some objects in A1, what would be the actual objects in C1 that you're then checking well, I mean, I, I, what I'll say is, uh, the question is, what does this really mean? I'm, I'm abbreviating the question, but um, the answer is, I don't know. And that's what this slide says. I don't think this is what you should do. It certainly is doable, but you then invite to this study so many things that probably have no meaning to you, to your applications, to the interest you have. But it does at least show that you could put this inside of some bigger box. There's a big enough box to fit everybody, but there's a lot of other players in that box. I would like a smaller box, a more natural box. So that's why this is in blue and yellow, is I want that, this is my quest, my request of the community to build the smaller box. Yes? When you had arrows, uh, clips of different pieces of the product? Or... Here? Uh, shuffle. You oh, shuffle. I'll find that maybe. You said you would apply some functor. Yeah, if I'd drawn this with a little bit less haste, you would be able to follow your finger through the arrows. Because that was what I was trying to demonstrate, is that the, the, the transpose, the, the shuffling operator is going to swap arrows according to what has to happen to make duels look nice. And so basically, there's a, there's, a, there's a place in your graph where you do this crossing over, right? Mm -hmm. And the point is that crossing over is got some variance to it. One arrow goes this way, another arrow goes the other way. So it's not just swapping positions, but swapping and flipping. Yes? So I, I, I haven't attended any of them, but I know that there are these meetings, like there was one at IAS a few years ago about type theory and motivation ah. for mathematics. And so That's a very particular type of type theory. OK, ask your question, though. Sorry, yeah. Well, maybe this is better over here. But yeah. you know, so you, you started with comments about kind of practical programming, but clearly uh, building on a, a philosophical notion yeah. of how to properly define objects. And so if, is, do you have a question there, or do you want me to talk about it? I don't, I'm trying to figure. So I'll say this. Well, I know it's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll say this just to make it, uh, I'd love to keep talking about it is the first thing. So the question was, um, or at least what I'm interpreting the, the comment about is, um, there is a lot of effort right now in the study of type theory, specifically around homotopy type theory in particular. There's been programs at IAS and Hausdorff Institute, and there's another one happening, I think, in Cambridge sometime soon. So why are people focusing on this? Maybe does this connect to that subject area? 
The main thing I've been interested in for a lot of my research is the notion of equality. What makes two things equivalent? You collect data, but you collect data with a bunch of assumptions. You say, I'm going to break it into codes where this is the category, column one, column two, column three, and then you find out afterwards it was more subtle. It was a linear combination of these categories that was actually the data that I was trying to study. So the point is, whatever grid we collect is just our best effort to put a measuring stick to what we see, and then we try to get rid of the measuring stick. That's what isomorphism is to me, is looking at data and saying, how do I get rid of the measuring stick that was arbitrary to collect the data and compare it to somebody else's measurements or find a more canonical version of the data? Well, the downside is, is that when you try to make theorems about this and when you try to prove algorithms around this, Equality is something that is logically harder than some of the questions about, like, is something in the set? And there's formality to say what harder means. There's things in the, in the type theory language, there's H levels. In set theory, there's first order, second order. And these are metrics that try to warn us as mathematicians, this is harder, strictly harder, than the kinds of questions you could ask right below that. So what has happened is that over time, I've had to inch towards that, oh, I'm really working in this groupoid, this two groupoid, this three groupoid, and I need to write that correctly. So at some point, you just have to invest in that language. I'm not saying it works for everybody's needs. I don't want to scare anyone away, but the truth is that equality studies something at a different level. You have to keep track of that, otherwise you get it wrong. That's what I've been doing with it. All right, well maybe let's 